start with Benito Mussolini. Mussolini was an Italian leader. He was a socialist journalist in, in his young incarnation, uh, the editor of something called The Future of the Worker, a small socialist publication in Italy. He became the leader of the Italian Socialist Party. And here you see a photograph of Mussolini. He loved to be photographed, so there are lots of them. Uh, and there's a very, very similar thing, the, the chin held out like this, and the chest fucked up. Here, I should give me a giant lecture like Mussolini, but uh, that would be strenuous. I don't know how he did it. Anyway, he took over the government of Italy shortly after the First World War. He became the leader in 1922, after the March on Rome. He was not elected initially, he simply led a large group of supporters on a march to Rome to take over the government, and they did. Here you see him with those leaders in 1922. <laughs> there, I mean, there is something fascinating about that photograph. Just look at Mussolini and look at the people around him. I mean, it's, it's a very expressive photograph. This is right at the early stages, you might say, of photojournalism as its own thing. And you see uh, some of these early photojournalists do an amazingly good job. Include, but look at that. Notice the kid at the top who's sort of photobombing the entire thing. <laughs> anyway, Mussolini did win election then in 1924, though he had already seized power. He discouraged dissent and used violence and intimidation to maintain control. He was not just another elected leader even after the election. He was somebody who uh, insisted on complete control. He gave large speeches <laughs> to large crowds, even though he was a small man. Here you see him with, in a sort of characteristic pose, up on a balcony with the streets crowded with people <laughs> doing this sort of gesture. He proclaimed himself Il Duce, the leader and used all of these traditional Roman symbols of power. In fact, fascism, the word, comes from the fasces, the things that used to be held by the Roman consuls as a sign of authority. And here you see, duce, 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 um, in the streets, done in the style of ancient Roman mosaics. The whole idea here was to imitate consciously the glories of ancient Rome and suggest that he was going to return Italy to those days. He insisted that all restraints on his power be removed. He was a very ca charismatic person, and he had some fine personal qualities. He loved cats, for example. <laughs> However, um, as a leader, well, he really redefined the relationship that was possible between the leader and the citizen. He began as a Marxist. In fact, his parents were socialist sort of anarchists, uh, he was heavily influenced by Marx, but also by Nietzsche. And in some ways, you can see Mussolini's fascism as a combination of Marx and Nietzsche, taking those two sources and combining them. <laughs> Marx, he described as his father and teacher, the magnificent philosopher of working class violence. But he also found inspiration in Nietzsche, saw Nietzsche as recommending this morality of the lion, of the predator as opposed to the prey, of strength. And so he was deeply inspired by both of those things and found in his own thinking a way of combining what he perceived as the insights of Marx and the insights of Nietzsche. He was also influenced very much by a third figure, Georges Sorel. Sorel was a French Marxist. He was a philosopher who believed um, in the power of violence. He developed a view known as revolutionary syndicalism. Now, there are two things that made it different from Orthodox Marxism, and one of those was his emphasis on violence. That's something that's very vague in Marx. Marx admits, look, it's unlikely that the bourgeoisie is going to give up power on its own, so in the end, yes, I'm calling for a revolution. But he certainly doesn't call for violence for its own sake, and suggests at crucial points that some things will happen, as it were, automatically through a transformation of society without violence. However, Sorel thought that violence was a virtue, that basically acquiescing in unjust social conditions was itself a form of injustice, and so it required violence to actually overcome this, not as an unfortunate necessary means, but as something that was, in a sense, good for its own sake. Theoretically, though, the most important divergence was his belief in the power of social myths, the power of images, the power of symbols, Syndicalism is really something based on the thought 
that Marx is wrong about one thing. He's wrong that in the end, all of the motivations of people are economic. They're not. Our ideas are shaped by ideas, by myths, by narratives, by symbols. And so the symbolic aspects of reality are just as important as the underlying material reality. Marx thought in the end, no, ideas are all superstructure. In the end, all that really matters is the material basis, the economic relations among people, uh, the means of production and control of the means of production. But Sorel said, no, it's really largely symbolic. You do a lot of what you do not because it's in your economic interest, but because of ideas, because you fit the world into a certain narrative. You tell yourself or others tell you a story about the world and you frame your actions to make sense within that story. This is still something that exists, as you see, there's a website. That was not Sorel's, <laughs> Mussolini didn't have access to the website, but re revolutionary syndicalism is still a thing. Now, it does, Mussolini, that is, does diverge from Marxism, partly in that belief in the power of social myths, in the power of the narrative, the stories we tell one another and tell ourselves. He believes in a revolutionary elite. He says the proletarians will indeed not be able to understand this on their own. There has to be an elite that is capable of telling these stories, communicating revolutionary consciousness to the proletariat. He rejects the economic determinism of Marx, just as Sorel does, and he rejects the class struggle. Marx, remember, begins the Communist Manifesto by saying the entire history of the world is a history of class struggle. And Mussolini says in the end, no, it's not. <laughs> It is, at least in part, a struggle of ideas, a struggle of narratives, a struggle of symbols and stories. And that is not really, in the end, economic at all. It's not something that reduces to a class struggle of pro proletariat versus bourgeoisie. It's really a question of the myths, the narratives, the stories that shape the way we interact with each other and interact with the world. So he develops a kind of heresy, if you will, a heresy that stresses the importance of symbols, stresses the importance of ideas, and also the importance of violence. He says his goal is to prepare the proletariat for the greatest bloodbath of all. Well, in this respect, Mussolini and Lenin have a lot in common. They diverge from orthodox Marxism in some overlapping ways. And both Leninism and Mussolini's fascism start as variants on something to the far left in the political spectrum. They're both taking Marxism and putting their own twist on Marxism. So in the case of Mussolini, we get Marx plus Nietzsche, essentially. The class struggle plus this idea of the will to power and this idea of culture, of ideas, as being critical. Now, <coughs> Mussolini then, at this stage, remember, he is still <laughs> he is still somebody who is the editor of a socialist newspaper, coming up with his own version of socialism. But then he sees what the rebel, Russian Revolution actually does. He is in many ways very similar to Lenin, but he looks at Lenin's revolution and sees that it was in many ways a disaster. In the winter of 1921-22, three million people died of starvation in Lenin's Russia. And at this point, Mussolini looks at things and says, wait a minute, <laughs> something has seriously gone wrong there. In effect, the idea that I had about how to sort of put a twist on Marxism to make it work is being played out in Russia right now, and it's working out to be a disaster. That's something that actually Lenin would have agreed with him about. By 1921 and 22, he was already seeing that, yes, there is the, fa the famine that is consuming large numbers of lives, industry has collapsed, and Lenin himself saw that his system faced a kind of dilemma. Market forces tend to reassert themselves. People want to actually produce things and trade them and do things without direction by the, the central government. Either you let that happen or you resist it. And if you try to stop those forces, it comes at a huge economic and human cost. And so what do you do? In Lenin's case, he found people are actually starving. We take the, tell the farmers that you have to grow the wheat and give it all to us, and we'll reapportion it fairly. And the result is they don't grow the wheat. They figure, look, if you're going to take it all anyway, why should I grow it? And so the result is mass starvation. Well, by this point, Lenin himself realized 
that I have to give the farmers some incentive to actually grow the wheat in the first place. So he instituted what he called the New Economic Program. It was something that required the farmers, for example, to give a large portion of their crops over to the central government for distribution, but allow them to keep some of it to use themselves and to sell. It was enough of an incentive that Russia began to recover, although it was already by then a bit too late for that coming winter, hence the starvation. But he had this idea that he would allow farmers, small peasants anyway, um, small farms, to engage in this kind of free enterprise, mutual exchange, in order to give people an incentive to actually grow the food to do the work. As we'll see next time, however, all of that got squelched by the fact that he had a stroke and then that Stalin assumed power. In any event, well, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we'll come back to those points. Mussolini then started realizing that Lenin's system, as he had initially set it up, was a disaster and realized that his own version of Marxism would be a similar sort of disaster. So he adapted. He came at this stage to reject the idea of class struggle and materialism and decided there had to be a different kind of solution to the problem that Marx and Lenin had perceived. Here is where he began to be very influenced by the syndicalists, realizing that myths, stories, narratives, those are actually crucial, and they undermine the whole story about the class struggle. So he began to think, if you tell the right narrative, use the right symbols, tell the right stories, you can unify the country and overcome class struggle without violence, actually without uh, the kind of revolutionary elite and without the disasters that accompanied the Russian Revolution. So his goal was on unity, on bringing classes together. He didn't want to destroy the bourgeoisie, which had been the earlier idea he had inherited from Marx and Lenin. Instead, he said, we've got to get all classes within society to work for a common goal. So here's a simple way to look at it. In Marx, things divide between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Solution to the problem, get rid of the bourgeoisie by eliminating private property and through revolutionary violence. <coughs> Mussolini says, get both the bourgeoisie and the proletariat to work together toward a common goal. What do they have in common? What do the Italian Marxists, or sorry, the Italian, well, yes, the Italian Marxists, the Italian proletariat, the Italian bourgeoisie, the Italian clerics, the Italian intellectuals, what do they all have in common? They're Italian, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, yes, get them to work for the good of greater Italy. So, his solution is, now not just to make them patriotic, that would be a relatively benign thing. You could say, hey, you know, let's, maybe Italy doesn't have such a nice flag. Let's, let's have a better flag. <laughs> let's teach people to love Italy. Somebody write a better national anthem and so on. No, it's not like that. Instead, he says, really, it is we have to teach dedication to the state. And here is his model. Everything within the state. Nothing outside the state. Nothing against the state. So actually, everybody has to be working for the state quite directly. And it is all about the state, not just a greater Italy, for example. This isn't a make Italy great again program. <laughs> this, is, this is a, no, it is specifically the state. Everybody is going to be part of the state. Everybody should be dedicated to the state. There should be the individual and the state and nothing else. So that means in particular, no individuals, no groups, no political parties, no cultural associations. No economic unions, no social classes outside the state. Now, there are all sorts of these other institutions. We talked about those when we discussed social capital in Kipling, right? The idea that there are many other forms of association. Clubs, colleges, universities, um, churches, various trade associations, all those types of things. Not to mention companies, corporations, etc. trade unions. Here, all of those are to be gotten rid of, political parties included. There should just be the individual and the state. Nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. Now, what kind of political movement does Mussolini then end up with? Well, if we try to categorize it as right or left wing, we get led into all sorts of puzzles. Fascism is usually considered a movement of the right. And yet, it doesn't make much sense, as we use that term, to think of it that way. If you think about its Marxist background, you can see it as a variant on Marxism, and so it should, should be on the left. So what should you really say about this? The Leninists considered it right-wing because it was to the right of Lenin, and that's fair enough. 
But really, if you step back, it's hard to say what to think about it in these terms. And as soon as you ask that question, is Mussolini's fascism a right-wing movement, a left-wing movement? It forces you to confront the question, what do we even mean by left and right? What does it mean for a political ideology or movement to be on the left? What does it mean for it to be on the right? Well, if you look at history, the terms come from the French Revolution. So from the, around 1789, we've got the left, meaning the supporters of the revolution. The right being those who resist the revolution, who are supporting the king, the traditional monarch. It's hard to know how to apply that to Mussolini or to contemporary American politics, for example. We don't have supporters of the monarchy left. I mean, is anybody here saying, oh, you know, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, forget all that. George III, he's my man. <laughs> um, that's, not, that's not the way we frame political issues at all. And so this is something that all right, historically is useful, but on the other hand, doesn't tell us much about what those terms mean now. Within two years, they were already outmoded even in France. The left meant the innovators, those who believed in the primacy of the legislature, as opposed to those on the right who defended the Constitution and believed in a strong executive. So there was something like the legislative branch versus the executive branch of government. That's a rather different issue. Now, if you look at contemporary Europe and judge the way Europeans tend to use these terms, it looks like this. Broadly speaking, to be on the left means to favor the redistribution of wealth, to believe in the power of reason, to believe that government and society should be largely secular and so oppose religion and its influence, and also a deep mistrust of strong leadership, whether it's in the executive branch or not. Now, not necessarily a distrust of large government, not at all, but a distrust of powerful leaders, partly because of the experience with people like, well, Mussolini and Hitler and other people we're going to be talking about this week. On the right, the themes emphasized in Europe tend to be the defense of private property, the importance of free enterprise, the importance of religion as something that provides a moral foundation for society, and the need for strong leadership. But that seems to me different from the way that it's used in the United States now, and you might be able to add to this list. I've actually generated this list by asking previous classes. But if you say, well, what do people on the left, broadly speaking, believe in the US now? It's sort of like, well, redistribution of wealth, the protection of minority groups, secularism, but not as extreme as in Europe, uh, a mistrust of private associations, a belief in big government, thinking that government has the solution to many kinds of social problems, and relatively few limits on government power. Whereas on the right, people emphasize, yes, the defense of property and free enterprise, the importance of religion and social capital, but also small government and limits on government power. Now, if we think of that sort of contemporary American way of thinking about right and left, how does Mussolini fit in? Which side is he on? Or does he look like he doesn't really fit on either side? It's sort of hard to tell, right? I mean, on the one hand, he clearly believes in strong authority. <coughs> so if we go back to that European idea of strong leadership, il dulce, yes, clearly uh, he has some elements of the right there. Um, on the other hand, as we'll see, he does believe in the redistribution of wealth. Uh, he is a defender of secularism. So in many ways, he mixes those. If we look at it in the American context, well, the redistribution of wealth, that argues for his movement being on the left. It is secularist, so yes. On the other hand, and he does believe in big government, yes. Um, on the other hand, well, he's hostile to private associations, as we've seen, nothing outside the state. He looks like he's mostly on the left. In any event, I think the better way to look at all of this is to think of things in terms of top-down as opposed to bottom-up political movements. A bottom-up movement says government gets its rights, its freedoms, its responsibilities, its privileges from the people. That is to say, the people are the ones who fundamentally have rights, have freedoms, have privileges, and they cede a certain amount of their power to the government. Whereas top-down theories think, no, 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 nobody in a state of nature would have any rights, or for that matter, any privileges or whatever. All of that comes from government authority. People get their rights their freedoms, their responsibilities, their privileges, etc., from the government. So our rights, our privileges, 
or responsibilities, or all those things that flow, as it were, from the top down, from the government to you? Or do they flow from you up toward the government, where you give the government certain <coughs> kinds of power over you, but usually then place limits on it too? This correlates with that right-left axis, but it isn't exactly the same thing. Now, if we think of it in those terms, which view is Mussolini's? Is Mussolini saying, I only get my privileges from the people? Or is he saying, you get your privileges from me? The second one, clearly. It's very much top-down. Fascism is very clearly a top-down movement, even if when we think left and right, it can easily seem confusing, especially if we're looking at that European set of, uh, set of attributes as opposed to the American one. Now, fascism has become a term by itself that is confusing. So forget for, quest for the moment the top-down <laughs> versus bottom-up, the right-left question, and just say, what is fascism? One of the things that disappointed me when I started teaching this course is that it's very hard to come up with a definition of fascism. Start looking at political philosophers, look at historians and so on. It's, it's a sort of mishmash. And the result of that is that everything gets called fascist. In fact, George Orwell, writing already in 1944, says, the word fascism is almost entirely meaningless. In conversation, of course, it's used even more wildly than in print. I've heard it apply to farmers, shopkeepers, social credit, corporal punishment, fox hunting, Bullfighting, the 1922 committee, the 1941 committee, Kipling, Gandhi, Chiang Kai-shek, homosexuality, Priestley's broadcast, youth hostels, astrology, women, dogs, and I don't know what else. <laughs> Except for the relatively small number of fascist sympathizers, almost any English person would accept bully as a synonym for fascist. That's about as near to a definition as this much abused word has come. So already by 1944, he was complaining about this. And if you look at historians, you see a variety of traits that are mentioned in connection with fascism, but only some of them actually apply even to Mussolini, who started the whole thing. Here are some common elements, though. One, a vanguard party, a small group that seizes political power. Secondly, a veneration of the state. Okay, Everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. Hostile to individual rights and liberties. He will say, actually, I stand for the right of the state, not for the rights of individuals. Authoritarian, not at all democratic. Il duce, the leader, right? The leader, not just one among many. <laughs> um, Anti-democracy, therefore. Ultra-nationalist. Insofar as the state is venerated, then the state and nationalism are used to try to unite the various social groups. A belief in violence, a belief in militarism. <coughs> Corporatist, usually with a mixed economy. That is to say, the government heavily directing the economy, but some things allowed to remain in private hands. So private property is not abolished, but it is limited. And it is broadly a movement that is anti-capitalist, anti-free market, anti-individualist, anti-conservative on the one hand, but also anti-communist. In fact, the fascists generally see themselves as having a third way. Here, it seems to me, as a way of defining fascism, the thought is it's a system of social and economic, uh, economic organization that places key institute, institutions in society under centralized authoritarian direction and control. So in particular, the government takes control of large numbers of social and economic institutions, but often through indirect means. Sometimes the government seizes them directly. But often, they are allowed to remain in private hands, but nevertheless are heavily regulated. Um, through government and private partnerships, for example, through placing people on boards of directors, by having corporate government boards, and so on. And so it is often a variant, in a sense, on Marxism, but it's not an abolition of private property, rather a forcing of private property to work hand in hand with government. Okay, now if that's what it is, let's think for a moment about what this would mean. Oh, by the way, that. That is meant to show you him not taking over control of a corporation, for example, but as hobnobbing with the, um, <laughs> the executives of, I think it's Ferrari there, and uh, basically saying, you know, you're going to work with the government, aren't you? So in that respect, it really is a variety of socialism. It is the belief that we should choose social goals and then choose the means to those goals in a centralized fashion. 
though often in an indirect, sort of cooperative way, rather than direct takeover. All right, well, this does make it communitarian as opposed to individualistic. In the fascist conception of history, Mussolini says man is man only by virtue of the spiritual process to which he contributes. As a member of the family, the social group, the nation, in the function of history, to which all nations bring their contribution, outside of history, man is an odd entity. Fascism is therefore opposed to all individualistic abstractions. Uh, it does not believe in the possibility of happiness on Earth. Indeed, the fascist conception of the state is so large that it's all-embracing. People have meaning only in connection with the state. No human or spiritual values can exist apart from the state. Therefore, it is totalitarian. The fascist state interprets, develops, and potentates the whole life of a people. So it is utterly anti-individualistic. You matter only insofar as you relate to the state. You and your life matter only to the extent you contribute to the good of the state. Fascism asserts the rights of the state as opposed to the rights of the individual. Indeed, the rights of the state express the real essence of the individual. So where the bottom-up theorist, someone like John Locke, stresses individual rights, individual liberties, it's the state's rights, the state's <laughs> liberty that are at issue for fascism. It's a belief in the rights of government and the liberty of government as opposed to the individual. And indeed, in that individualistic conception of Locke, it is really opposed to liberty. The only liberty worth having is the liberty of the state. So fascism spells government. If liberalism, here it means in the sense of the class, classical bottom-up liberalism of Locke, spells individualism, fascism spells government. So it is something that argues for no limits on power. And Mussolini, for a time, was heralded as introducing a better form of government. He was a very popular leader in Italy, and he attracted a lot of attention outside. What was his program? Well, to have rule by an elite, a national council of experts, to insist on a minimum wage and an eight-hour workday, mandatory retirement age of 55. There was a nationalization of military industries, at least, a strong progressive tax on capital. He seized church property. He also got people to donate their gold to the fatherland and took control in the end of three-fourths of Italian business. So really, it was about three-fourths the abolition of private property, one-fourth retention of it, but under government supervision. In addition, all teachers had to swear a loyalty in it. The government took on a strong propaganda program. And there was a kind of cult of personality around Mussolini himself. All editors of publications were appointed by Mussolini. <laughs> so here you see him giving a speech, another one, etc. Now, let's talk about the rise of Hitler. While all this was going on in Italy, dramatic events were taking place in Germany. At the end of the war, in October, just before the armistice was signed, the country actually came close to a communist revolution. A revolt began in Kiel led by workers there, and in the end, there was only, well, there was great difficulty in putting down that communist rebellion. The fighting against the radical groups continued. The Weimar Republic was the German form of government between 1919, after the Treaty of Versailles, and 1933. It was born in defeat as a result of the Versailles Treaty, and its first act was to sign the Treaty of Versailles. So, the treaty ended up imposing very, very harsh conditions on Germany. And since this government, set up by the Allies, had as its first act signing those surrender agreements that had terrible terms for Germany, you might imagine that Germans did not think highly of the Weimar government. It started out really being born in defeat and, in a sense, expressing foreign domination to those who were German. The Treaty of Versailles itself was something that lots of people had noble ideas about, but in the end, Wilson's ideas did not prevail. Both France and Britain insisted on strong reparations from Germany, and so Germany had to take responsibility for the First World War, had to surrender territory, the Rhineland, the Tsar, um, alsace lorraine the Eastern Farmland, and the Danzig Corridor, and all of its colonies. It had to pay reparations, which would amount to about $500 billion dollars in today's currency. It had to limit its army and navy, 
to a very small number and had to get rid of its air force entirely. So those were heavy terms. Germany had to basically demilitarize. It had a crippling debt that it was asked to pay, and it's lost a significant portion of its territory. So here you see Germany before the war and all of the parts that it had to give up. Yeah. Um, I read somewhere that only recently did Germany pay off all the debts that was owed from World War I. Like in like 2006 or 2008, it finally paid it off. Right. It, I hadn't heard that, but that is not surprising in a way. It was a crushing debt, an absolutely astounding burden. Think about 130 <coughs> billion marks, so a half a trillion dollars in today's currency. The entire federal budget of the United States is now what? Close to four trillion? So you're talking about an amount, an amount that for a smaller country like Germany, suffering the defeat of the war and devastated as a result of that, found just impossible. I mean, it was an amount of debt that the Germans looked at and just said, you know, it will take generations. And they, they, they were right, it will take generations to pay this off. And they lost some of their best farmland in addition to all of that. So it was more and more difficult to put it together. There in blue is the German Empire before the war. Here, Germany is after the war. Well, this was a crushing financial burden. Here you see a German publications cartoon depicting this Germany being led to the guillotine by Wilson, Clemenceau, and Lloyd George. And so there was a sense of tremendous injustice against the Allied powers. Well, how could you pay such a crushing debt? Print money. And so the solution Weimar adopted <laughs> was to start printing currency. And here you see hyperinflation, as it existed in Germany between 1918, the end of the war, and then 1923. I can show this much more graphically by showing you <coughs> what it cost for a loaf of bread. How much would it cost you now to go to a grocery store and buy a loaf of bread? <coughs> $2, yeah, maybe two, three dollars. Go to H-E-B and get the store brand on sale, it might be 79 cents, something like that. But, you know, it depends on uh, what you're tasting bread about. Anyway, here was the price of a loaf of bread in pennies in the German currency um, in 1914, 13 cents, before the war. During the war, it went up to 19 cents. 1918, 22 cents. Now, that's already significant inflation, right? The price has almost doubled during the length of the war. But a year later, 26 cents. <coughs> Then, 1920, a dollar, well, a mark, 20. By 1921, a mark, 35. 1922, well, three marks, 50. Still, I mean, that's extreme inflation, notice, but still, an amount of money you might have in your pocket. But that was January of uh, 22. By January 1923, 700 marks. By June, 1,200 marks. September, 2 million marks for a loaf of bread. October, 670 million marks for a loaf of bread. November 1st, 3 billion marks. By November 15th, 100 billion marks. In just like two weeks, it went up 97 billion marks. That's right. A slight price increase. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, it is true. The, pri the price of bread went up by 33 times in two weeks, right? And so went up from 3 billion to 100 billion Wait. marks. Is a mark like a dollar or is it like a penny? It's a mark is like a dollar. At least it was like a dollar before the war, before all this happened. <laughs> okay, so imagine this now. You're buying bread for 13 cents. Well, then it's like a dollar 20. So like, you might think, oh, dollar 35, three. Maybe we're in the year <coughs> 1922 here, right? Oh, a loaf of bread. Yeah, I might pay 350 for it. Imagine that a year later, it's $700. <laughs> that six months later, it's $1,200. By September, it's $2 million for a loaf of bread. By November 15th, $100 billion, please. How do you function? Yeah? Did all food go up like this, or is there something special? No, it's nothing special about bread. It's not that there was a huge wheat shortage or something. It's just all prices went up like this. Yeah? Well, exactly. This is happening right now in Venezuela. Um, and it happened a few years ago in Zimbabwe. Um, Venezuela, now the current inflation rate is 2,300%, um, which means prices are going up in one year by the equivalent of 23 times. Uh, so uh, here you had something like that happening, but at this radically increasing rate, so that by November it was completely out of control. 
People insisted on being paid twice a day because the money you would get for your morning's work was going to be worthless by that evening. And so people would sort of get paid for the morning, rush out and buy things as soon as they could because prices by that afternoon would make their morning early earnings basically worthless. And everything was going up this way. So you see some of the currency produced during this. Here is a 50 million mark note from September 1st. Here you see a 100 billion mark note. Here, is, I mean, it's hard to print currency fast enough in this case, so here's what they started doing, just stamping old bills with new things. This turned a thousand mark note into a billion mark note. Well, people needed so much currency that, you know, it became a problem. How do you store all this money? So here you see a woman having a, a column in her house that is basically hollowed out so she can store cash inside the pillar. Here you see someone going to the bank with a wheelbarrow <laughs> full of money. <laughs> the money became so worthless that here, people, the children were allowed to just play with building blocks of cash. It was cheaper than buying the building blocks. That was yesterday's currency. It was basically worthless anyway. And so the kids just played with it. Here you see people making kites out of money. Stacking it to the ceiling just as a toy, like building blocks. Here, using it as wallpaper. Wallpaper? Um, <laughs> here, people trading entire baskets of money for a loaf of bread. Here you see someone heating her stove by burning money. People talk about burning cash. Well, she's literally burning cash. It's cheaper than heating fuel. <laughs> you want to cook something for dinner? Just toss a little money in the stove and light it on fire. It was last week's money. Here you see money being swept up as trash in the streets because it was so worthless. I mean, once a loaf of bread is 100 billion marks, you look down and you say, oh, that's a 50 mark note. It's worthless. I'm not going to stoop down and even pick it up. And here you see a woman reduced to poverty by this. Her sign says, hello, um, I want work. <laughs> and she explains for her something about her history. She is looking for any sort of job. Now, what does this kind of hyperinflation do to a country? It humbles it completely. Yeah, well, that's right. It humbles it completely. Imagine that, you know, in a few months, a loaf of bread is going to cost $700, then $1,200, then shortly after that, $2 million, then $100 billion. <coughs> what does that do? I mean, you might, right now, do you have any money with you? <laughs> Take yeah. uh, I have three dollars, three American dollars, okay? Right now, this isn't worth very much, but still I could buy a burrito. <laughs> However, you know, by the time something like this happens, this becomes utterly worthless. Now, of course, I have a savings account. I've been teaching here for 37 years. So I have a retirement ac account. It has a certain amount of money in it. It looks to me now like a pretty good amount of money. But imagine after this hyperinflation, all of a sudden, you know, let's say you finally get there, you've saved a million dollars, and then you find out, oh, shoot, next week that will buy me one loaf of bread. <laughs> there goes my life savings. So it wiped out people's savings. It destroyed the German middle class. All savings, all pensions became utterly worthless. You might think, hey, I can retire and still make 60000 a year. And then by the next week, 60000 is something that people won't bother to pick up off the streets because it's worth almost nothing. So most wealth became worthless. In general, though, virtues of thrift, of prudence, of saving for the future, of planning for the future, all of that became ridiculous. And people started thinking that all of those traditional virtues, work hard, save your money, uh, think about the future, plan, defer gratification, all of that seemed now like a cruel joke. You were a chump, people thought, if you did that. Because look what happened. Everything you would work for was lost within a matter of a few months. The entire middle class was destroyed. And so was middle class morality, the system of norms, the system of values that really underpinned most of German society. All of a sudden, people said all of that was a fool's game. In the end, all that thrift, all that hard work came to nothing. Thousands, of course, became homeless. Debtors benefited immensely. Wait, I owe you a thousand marks and I was worried about paying back? Oh. Gee, I found one on the street. Here you go. <laughs> right? So it was great for debtors, terrible for those who were creditors. Um, there was an, well, an emphasis on consumption. 
yeah, you get paid in the morning, and if by that evening, that money's gonna be worthless, you better go out and spend it right now. So there was no point to say, you better consume whatever you have as quickly as possible before the prices go up. People hoarded objects as a result of that, because the objects kept rising in value. It destroyed investments. There was no sensible measure of how well an investment was doing. The government found it couldn't collect taxes enough. By the time April rolled around and people filled out their tax forms, let's say, and had to write that check, the amount they owed was basically worthless. And so the government suddenly found it had no money. And nobody, including the government, could borrow anything because nobody had any confidence that the mark would be worth even what it was worth today, tomorrow. Well, Weimar did, having gotten into this trouble, cut the Gordian knot. Basically, they said the only solution to this is to establish a new currency basically establish a new mark. And so they did that. They did manage to stabilize the economy, but already a huge amount of damage had been done. In addition, an American official, Dawes, crafted what became known as the Dawes Plan. <coughs> Germany would resume its payments under the Versailles Treaty, but with borrowed American money. <laughs> so, here was the idea. Germany would borrow say two and a half billion dollars in loans from the United States in a given year. It would pay the Allies, Germany, I start rather Britain, France, and the United States, two billion out of that in reparation payments, but it got to keep half a billion to manage to stabilize its economy. And then the Allies, oh, I should really say that goes to Britain and France, and then the Allies themselves had to make 2.6 billion in war debt payments to the United States. So what's happening? The US shovels two and a half billion to Germany. It sends two billion to France and Britain. They send 2.6 billion back to the United States. It's a good deal for the United States. We pay out 2.5 billion, we get back 2.6. Awesome. Germany gets to keep half a billion. Cool. <laughs> the French and the British, however, get two billion back and have to pay out two and a half billion. Not so great for them. 2.6 billion. Anyway, it's a weird setup, and it was this cycle that kept things going for a while, and it was this that broke down in 1929. In any event, what happened after that was a kind of golden age in Weimar. We had in literature Bertolt Brecht, Thomas Mann, Franz Kafka, Hermann Hesse. In science, we had Heisenberg and the advent of quantum mechanics. In the arts, it was the era of Bauhaus, so Paul Klee, Max Ernst, Vasily Kandinsky. In philosophy, people like Martin Heidegger, Edmund Husserl, Martin Buber, the Berlin Circle, the Vienna Circle, people like my own teacher, Karl Hempel, Hans Reichenbach, Kurt Gödel, um, Rudolf Carnap, Moritz Schlick, and so on. Many of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century were active in Weimar at this time. In social theory, the Frankfurt School, people like Adorno, Weber, um, in music, Bayer, Berg, Schoenberg, Hindemith, and so on. And so you had a tremendous burst of German culture at this stage, where all of a sudden these economic things were put aside for a while, and Weimar seemed to be succeeding radically. Well then, if, that's, if things are so great, if they've recovered from all this, how does Hitler come onto the scene? The answer is this. Hitler started out as an artist. He was a corporal in the army during World War I. He was devastated to learn of the German defeat. He was in the hospital at the time, heard. His art career did not go anywhere. He applied for admission to the Art Academy in Vienna and was denied. Some people think about this philosophical question, if you could go back in time, would you assassinate Hitler? There's a kinder and gentler version of that. Would you somehow get him admitted to the Vienna Art School? <laughs> Maybe would have produced paintings instead of death camps. But in any event, um, this is an example of his uh, artwork. I think it's not bad, actually. In any of it. Well, yeah, she said, ah, it's awful. That's what they thought Vienna. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. In 1923, he led the Munich Beer Hall, put to try to take over, much like the revolutionaries in Kyle had done, uh, to start a revolution. It failed, and he was arrested in jail. But he didn't stay in, the, in prison for very long. While he was in prison, he read mostly German philosophy, I've got to warn you. But here we see the New York Times reporting on his release. Hitler tamed by prison. He is expected to return to Austria. Adolf Hitler, once the demigod of the reactionary extremists, was released on parole from imprisonment. 
He immediately left uh, in an auto from Munich. He looked a much sadder and wiser man today. <laughs> okay, his behavior was such that he is no longer to be feared. It's believed he will retire to private life and return to Austria, the country of his birth. Well, would that it were so. Instead, he really took over a party and began a political movement. He was inspired by a number of things he did recent, read in prison, even if by horrible misinterpretations of them. He read Kant and came across Kant's idea of the Rechtsweg, the kingdom of ends, a systematic union of ends, and that became in part Hitler's goal, to guarantee that all of society had a systematic union of ends, that everyone shared the same goals. He read Hegel and saw this image of the state as expressing the spirit of the age. He read Nietzsche and saw Nietzsche talking about the blonde beast roaming the plains as a predator and thought all of these were inspiring. He got this idea from Nietzsche and Heidegger of authenticity, expressing who you really are, and realized, yes, <laughs> freedom consists in not being subject to constraints. Well, I'm going to skip past the details there, but ended up declaring himself a socialist and taking over the German Workers' Socialist Party. So, what did this mean? Well, he ended up writing a work called Mein Kampf to explain what this meant in practice. There were two great evils according to that work, Judaism and communism. It's a picture of a leader leading the crowds through propaganda, through stories, through symbols. So in that way, it has a lot in common with Mussolini. And he supplements the Marxist class analysis with race. Marx said the entire history of the world is a history of class struggle. Hitler says it's also a history of racial struggle. And so the fundamental concept that he substitutes for Marx's idea of class is that of race. And says in the end, life is a struggle for power among the various races. So, in the end, his program was based on that book. 